Hello everyone and welcome back to 27 Crows Radio. Today I'm speaking with Greg Johnson, the editor-in-chief of Countercurrents Publishing, Books Against Time. Greg is also a talented author. He's written and edited several works about the new right and how we can live according to golden age principles during a dark time of decadence when all things that are healthy and natural are demonized. Welcome to the podcast, Greg. Thank you for having me on. It's great finally to have this uh, opportunity. Absolutely, because I tried scheduling it a few times and we kept having difficulties, or I kept having difficulties, so I'm thrilled to finally have you on. Well, it took hurricanes to uh, stop us. So Yes, it, it took a natural disaster of epic proportions to stop my internet connection from working properly. <laughs> so Otherwise, always... we would have done this a while ago. So Yes, yeah. yes. I'm always curious to find out um, how people came around to nationalism or the alt-right in general, because everyone's story is so different. So what brought you around to nationalism? Well, it's a pretty long story. I've always been sort of on the right as long as I can remember, when I was a teenager and formulating ideas about politics, I was into Milton Friedman and Ayn Rand, people like that. So I was a kind of libertarian. And then I carried that with me through college. And near the end of my undergraduate experience, I read a book by Thomas Sowell, who's a a black conservative slash libertarian writer called The Conflict of Visions. And in there, he makes a distinction between constrained and unconstrained visions of society and human potential. And the unconstrained vision is a set of assumptions about human nature that gives rise to liberalism. And the constrained vision is a different view of human nature that gives rise to conservative ideas. And although I saw the logic of the constrained vision as he laid it out, it made more sense to me. I realized that my own thinking was really very much unconstrained. I had a lot of classical liberal enlightenment notions, assumptions in my thinking that I was forced to question. And at the same time I was reading Soul, I was also reading Journey to the End of the Night by Celine, which is a pretty bleak and misanthropic book that can really cure you because it rings so true of any kind of naive enlightenment, progressive notions about the basic goodness of mankind and our ability to perfect ourselves over time through something called progress. And so that word com- progress. <laughs> yeah. So the combination of Thomas Sowell working on the intellectual level and Celine working on my gut led me to discard classical liberalism basically and start searching for a more paleoconservative traditionalist view of things, a kind of anti-rationalist view of things. And when I went off to graduate school, I I started exploring these sorts of ideas more. And so I was sort of a paleocon, although I was also very interested in culture. And so I was reading neocon publications like The New Criterion. I also read Commentary Magazine. And I deepen my understanding of what you can call the anti-rationalist conservative tradition. And that would include writers like Edmund Burke, but also I got interested in people like Johann Gottfried Herder and after him, uh, the German romantics, and then uh, people like Heidegger and Gadamer in the 20th century who argue that, and also Michael Polanyi, who argue that rationality abstract reasoning is embedded in practices, social practices and languages that are not something that we can fully understand and separate ourselves from and criticize, much less replace. And so what that leaves you with is a kind of piety towards your inherited language and traditions, your inherited identity, which is something that is the bedrock of of thinking and political action. And yet a lot of modern rationalist utopian thinkers believe that somehow things like language and tradition are negligible uh, and that we can simply overcome these things, again, through what they call progress. And so 
at, at a certain point, though, I realized that biological differences, racial differences, uh, mattered as well. It's not just differences of culture and identity and language. There's differences of, of race, of biology. A part of that had to do with uh, finally having experiences in large, diverse metropolitan areas and seeing that people really were very different and learning from experience. Uh, then I started reading about uh, basically uh, first the, the great book that I read and I was sort of resistant to it, but I, I, I found it very challenging was The Bell Curve by Herrnstein and Murray. That's because, one I still need to read, yeah. Yeah, it's an amazing, amazing work of social science uh, and policy analysis, basically. And although only a part of it really deals with race and IQ, it overwhelmingly proves, first of all, that IQ, that intelligence, is the most important factor in modern civilization. And it also pretty devastatingly shows that there are biological differences between the races in terms of intelligence and therefore biological differences between the races in terms of how well they're going to do in modern Western societies. And that pretty much destroys any possible egalitarian notion that we can have a working multiracial society. And of course, IQ differences are just the beginning. Uh, then I read Michael Levin's book, Why Race Matters, and that's a classic of its type. And I had read uh, Levin's book, uh, Feminism and Freedom. And that's a brilliant critique of feminism from a trained philosopher. And why race matters, though, is on an even higher level, I think, of brilliance. And it synthesizes everything about racial differences, including differences in a whole host of, of psychological and moral dimensions. And so the races aren't just different in terms of their ability to do math, right, do sums. They're different in terms of things like levels of sociopathy or psychopathic personality traits, uh, levels of empathy, ability to plan ahead and envision the future, and all kinds of things like that, a sense of causality, a sense of personal responsibility. All these things vary from race to race, and they're biologically based. And what that was leading me to the conclusion of is that we really should have separate societies. For a long time, I just thought, well, if we got rid of affirmative action and laws forcing people to live together, we would just naturally self-segregate. If we had, you know, got rid of egalitarian assumptions about how people's social outcomes should be, people would just get used to the fact that we have unequal outcomes for different racial groups. I, I thought that was a possibility, but it really came uh, to, it really, how to put it, eventually I just thought, well, it might be possible, but why burden ourselves with this? Why burden ourselves with a society where we have groups with radically different natures, groups that have radically different ways of life that are comfortable for them and expect that they're all going to be equally happy in the same social and political framework. It's like the bed of Procrustes, right? You know, some people are too long for it. Some people are too short for it. And instead of mutilating people to fit your social paradigm, why not just go our separate ways? The the model of divorce, the analogy of divorce is a really powerful one because, well, first of all, divorce is way too common in our society. People are willing to go their separate ways with a spouse half the half, 50 percent of the time uh, now. And the, the causes of divorce that you can find for no fault divorce are just basically pervasive differences in how you lead your life. And when two people who are just too different from one another have to live together in close proximity, eventually it breeds simmering resentment. It makes people unhappy. And sometimes if, if you don't go your separate ways, it can flare up into violence. And I thought, well, why not a racial divorce? Hmm. Why not? That's clever. Yeah. Why not a no-fault racial divorce? Just say, look, this isn't working out. 
I wish it did. It's not working out. We need to go our separate ways. We will all be happier. And of course, in societies in Europe, which were monoracial from the beginning of time, it made even more sense uh, there to try and hold on to their ethnic and racial homogeneity. And of course, they were losing that through massive immigration from the non-white world. And so eventually, white nationalism just made sense to me. And by white nationalism, I mean simply this. It's the idea that every white, every white people, every white society, every distinct white nation, if they aspire to sovereignty, they should be given their own homeland. And there are many white nations that don't have states, the Bretons in France, right? The Catalonians in Spain. Uh, if these people aspire to sovereignty, I say, let them go. If they'll be happier on their own, let them go. And so I, and I believe that for all peoples. I'm an ethno-nationalist for all nations, white, black, brown. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's, it's a terrible crime to force people to live in a way that's just not comfortable for them. And therefore, ethnic nationalism, where you try as best you can to create homogeneous sovereign homelands for all distinct peoples, is a way of decreasing unnecessary conflict between peoples, uh, different people sharing the same system, and also creating conditions for flourishing and divergent evolution, where the Catalonians can evolve a Catalonian society, a society that's comfortable for them, where they can have a flag that represents them and a national anthem in their own language that represents them and a way of life that's wholly comfortable. That's what I stand for. Uh, I don't want this sort of idea that we all need a, there's a one size fits all sort of Maoist boiler suit model of politics for everybody. We all have to have the same model. It just doesn't make any sense. I really like that explanation and it makes a lot of sense to me as well when you say that because when I look at these other ethnic groups like Hispanics and blacks, I can just kind of see by their behavior that they don't like us. Wouldn't they want to go home? And then you realize, well, no, it's the welfare state and things like that maybe that are keeping them here. But if they have such pride in their ethnic identity, why wouldn't they want to go back? And when they are forced to go back by ICE, even though they're waving a Mexican flag, they're like, no, no, I don't want to go back. But you would think that if they have such racial pride that they would want to. Yeah, there's the whole Gibbs factor that's definitely uh, involved here. And we have to say no. We have to say, no, I'm sorry, you're not coming here and having four kids and going to the emergency room and passing on all the bills to mostly white taxpayers. That's that's got to end. And I think that if we cut off all the benefits that these people get when they come here, they'll start deporting themselves. I don't even think you will need ice to drag them kicking and screaming. They'll they'll want to leave if they can't get the benefits they come here from because Otherwise, in, ter in terms of their living standards, uh, I mean, put it this way, the only reason they want to leave, leave their homelands is because they can improve their living standards in America. And when they come here, they recreate in little ghettos the conditions of their own homeland. But economically, they're sustained by the American system. And so they feel pretty at home, at least in their little neighborhoods. But they, they, they're much more prosperous. If we cut off their ability to seek employment and benefits and things like that, they're going to want to leave. And when they leave their neighborhoods anyway, they feel out of place. They feel alienated. And they don't like us. I mean, it's obvious. That's just that they don't really like us. us. <laughs> yeah. And I just don't see why we should have guests who are permanently living off uh, uh, the dole because most of these people even though it's a cliche that mexicans for instance work hard they don't work hard enough to merit all the stuff that they get from the system you know often they're not paying any taxes in at all and yet they are getting all kinds of benefits and so they're a net loss for the the country but they are a gain for their employers who can em employ them for less than they would be able to if we had a tighter labor market. But they don't like us. 
Uh, I don't see why we should have guests in our household who are eating up our substance and hating us at the same time. Anybody with a shred of pride would say no to that. And I think it's just time for Americans to to have a shred of pride. Uh, you would, we wouldn't put up with this in our own homes. Why are we putting up with this in our own country? Exactly. I mean, I have memories when I was a kid uh, before things got really bad with the immigration, just back in the early 90s, I would go to the mall just to get a stuffed animal or something or whatever. And it was always a white kid, a high schooler working behind the counter at the food court or behind the ping pong machine or whatever the, the, the uh, arcade. It was always white kids. And now when I go to my local mall, it's all middle-aged Indians or middle-aged Hispanics. And I know they're not really getting a good working wage. So I don't know why. I, compared to what they get back home, it was probably pretty good. But they always say, well, those are jobs Americans don't want. And I can remember a time when those were the jobs that teenagers would vie to get. It used to be teenagers mowing the lawn outside. And now I look outside and it's nothing but Hispanics doing that. So there's that lie of, well, they're doing the jobs Americans don't want, which is clearly untrue because I can remember a time when we did do those jobs. We did do those jobs. Uh, when people say they're doing the jobs that Americans don't want to do, you have to complete the thought at a sub minimum wage. Mm -hmm. they're, you know, they're, they're doing jobs that Americans wouldn't do because they're ill paid and Americans expect more. Americans want to lead a middle class American lifestyle. Americans want to live in a house and they don't want to have 12 other people living with them. And so I had this one guy that I knew who was actually a good guy say, well, I just can't employ Americans in my chicken processing plant. It's like, I, I said to him, look, if you paid me a decent wage, I'd work in your chicken processing plant. It's right. just a matter of what you're willing to pay. And it's so interesting that the wealthy in America love to spend money on useless stuff that's a symbol of status, right? Yes, like these Hummer cars. I cannot stand Hummers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, and you'd think that maybe someday we could teach them to take pride in employing their own people for a little more money, right? They don't, they don't need, uh, you know, um, a Tesla. They can get by with a Prius. Everything more that they're paying is just for status. Yet they don't want to pay a little extra money to employ their own people because there's no status in that. They feel like suckers if they do that. And we need to change people's mentality. We need to change the status system in America. Uh, and we can do that. And there was a time, believe it or not, when one of the most patriotic American organizations was the Chamber of Commerce, believe it or not. Uh, Willis Cardo told me that in the 40s and 50s, uh, the Chamber of Commerce was a very patriotic organization. Today, the whole realm of the commercial classes is basically the most rootless and cosmopolitan and disloyal uh, group of people in America because they're basically thinking of every possible way that they can dis uh, that they can dismantle the American economy for their own profit. Of course, they don't want the entire economy dismantled. They just want in their little sector dismantled because they know if the entire economy were dismantled, there'd be nobody here to buy their lawnmowers or their TVs or whatever that they're now making overseas. So it, it's a classic example of where people, if they're allowed to pursue their own self-interest, will create a situation that's bad for them and everyone else. Do you and think that's, that we can't. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, we can't let that happen. We need we need the legislation to put boundaries around America, basically, uh, to prevent people competing, basically, to dismantle the American economy by over uh, by by sending jobs overseas. Do you think if there was a sense of racial pride that we managed to instill back in Americans that they'd be more willing to hire their own, or it's now it's just such a decadent search for profit i think that if you change people's values they will behave differently so yes i i think though that what you what, what has to be done is you have to close off the option of being the sociopathic businessman who has no connections because in society today the people who have the least amount of patriotism 
are the ones who have the greatest advantage because they're the ones who are able to throw overboard more people, uh, cut more corners, screw more people just for their own private uh, profits. And we don't want a system that rewards rootlessness and lack of empathy and lack of patriotism. We don't want that. So if we change people's values, what we'll have to do is not just hope that changing their values will make them all behave better as individuals. We also have to change legislation so that there's no advantage for the one sociopath in the bunch to uh, you know, continue with the present business as usual and, and gain an advantage over his, his competitors. So we need protectionist laws. We need to prevent people from importing cheap labor from overseas and from shipping factories and work abroad. What kind of legislation would you like to see changed? Like just, just that, just protectionism? Or what do you, kind of laws do you think would help protect Americans, First, Americans getting jobs? And for uh, close the borders, uh, send illegals back. Uh, that's one of the main causes of uh, wage, inst- wage instability, lowering wages for people by increasing the number of people in the labor market. We want a tight labor market. We want high wages. A tight labor market where there are high wages creates a middle class, and it also spurs the business community towards technological progress because they're always trying to think of ways to make workers more productive. And if they can't, quote unquote, increase productivity by cutting the cost of labor, which is how most production gains happen now, uh, production is just, you know, how much do you pay per widget output, right? Productivity. And there are two ways of increasing productivity. One is by making labor actually more productive by creating capital and organizing things better. So the actual laborer makes more because he's got machines. The other way of quote unquote increasing productivity is simply cutting the cost of labor. And the trouble with that though is that it stagnates technological growth and it undermines communities. And so what we need to do is close off the option of cost cutting by basically shipping factories overseas. If they want to build a factory overseas in China or the Philippines or Indonesia, we're going to charge them a huge amount of money to ship the products back. So they might as well just stay here. If they want to build for the Indonesians, produce for the Indonesians, fine. But if you're producing for Americans, we want these things to be produced in the United States and we'll put tariffs on import goods. That's how we save Uh, American workers. Uh, And we'll pay a little bit more, but we'll have flourishing communities rather than wastelands full of uh, people uh, addicted to drugs and hopelessness. And we'll have uh, steady technological progress that will make us all more productive. We'll end up living finally in that Jetsons world with the flying cars uh, if we do that. Whereas uh, the whole dynamism of technology has been unstrung uh, by basically globalization. Globalization undermines technological progress by making it possible for companies to be more profitable simply by cutting costs rather than by actually investing in machines and processes that make labor more productive. What do you say about these companies that say, oh, we'll build a plant in Mexico, but don't worry, we'll hire Americans? Because to me, I hear something like that, and I think, I can't think of many Americans who will willingly move to Mexico and be away from their families like that. Right, right. Uh, it seems we like just a backward way of just no. hiring, just hiring yeah. Mexicans. <laughs> yeah, and, and it, it's also... <sighs> One thing that we want to do as, a, as an economic and social policy is make it possible for people to have stable, rooted, private lives. And you don't want an economy that encourages rootlessness. Well, I wrote this essay called Five to Nine Conservatism, meaning conservatism from five in the afternoon when you get off work till nine in the morning the next day when you go back. Uh, Because the kind of conservatism that we have today is nine to five conservatism. It really just thinks about business and work. 
And the trouble with that kind of conservatism is if you think just in terms of making businesses more profitable, uh, it, it tends to cut into private life. So, for instance, it's always weird when you go abroad or for Americans to go abroad to places in Europe. And we find that stores aren't open all the time like they are in the United States. I experienced <laughs> right? that when I live in the UK. Yeah. Yeah. And in the United States, there's, there's an incentive for people to try and eke out a little bit more profit by staying open a little longer. And eventually you get a 24 hour economy uh, out of that. You sell the same amount of bread, right? But you've got to keep the lights on and the store occupied 24 hours a day rather than, you know, say 16 hours a day or 12 hours a day. Uh, as you might before. And what that does is it undermines people's ability, employees' ability to, you know, go home and have dinner with their families, things like that. You have entire industries where people start off at graveyard shift, right? And <clears throat> it would be nice if we just said, look, uh, we have laws. Uh, most businesses close at six o'clock. Uh, most businesses are shut on Sundays. And that means that we're restricting the liberty of the nine to five world, which has become 24 seven anyway, in order to increase stability in the five to nine world in the, in the realm of private life. And I think that we should make that an, uh, a, 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 an important factor, a high value in crafting social and economic policies. We want people to be able to have private lives as well as to be productive, uh, to start businesses, have jobs. And it hasn't stopped Germany from being one of the most productive and uh, wealthy countries in the world to not have a 24-7 economy like we do in, in many sectors of the American economy. So laws like that are important. And one thing that I would especially like to get rid of are industries that encourage people to constantly move. <laughs> Right? Yeah, I, I've moved over 15 times in my life because of my father's job. So yes, I can yeah. I can sympathize with that. Yeah, and I think that uh, that's just not a uh, it's no it's no way to live. It, it it's doesn't hard. allow you to plant a root. Yeah, yeah, it, it exactly. Or you know, make friends at last and things like that. It's 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 not a good thing. So th those are the kinds of policies that I'd like to have. I'd I'd like to have policies that put private life family life and community life first, but give within that uh, space as much private enterprise as, as, as is reasonable uh, and to, you know, have a productive economy. There's no reason that we can't have both. And like I said, Germany today and many other countries in Europe actually have that kind of balance and they're doing quite well. And the quality of life is high uh, there, not just in terms of per capita income, but also in, in terms of leisure time, ability to, to have affordable families, stable families, and things like that. When I was going to school in uh, England for a while, I got my graduate degree in England, I heard a lot of the other graduate students say they wanted to move to Germany just because the quality of life there was really nice as far as stability and being able to raise a family and having a good social life. And I guess that's because of what you just said. They put more value on the individual being able to have a private life. Yeah. And I think that's, that's very, very important. I think that's been undermined in America by the American conservative idea that somehow economic uh, liberty is the, the core of what it is to be free. Uh, it's actually not, and it is sometimes corrosive, destructive of other values that people should want to conserve. Uh, I read that you refer to conservatism as a right-wing ghetto preventing whites from discovering their identity. Can you explain that to my listeners who might still be leaning toward paleo conservatism and what you mean by that and why they need to leave the right-wing ghetto? Well, there are a couple things that you might be referring to. For one thing, I I believe I'm a nationalist. I, I really want to promote the idea that nationalism, ethnic nationalism, having sovereign nations for distinct peoples is a good thing. 
And historically speaking, nationalism has always been a phenomenon that has transcended the left-right distinction. There was a time in the 19th century when nationalism was the leftist thing. Really? Uh, for instance. Oh, yeah. Um, in the 19th century, nationalism was the force against the throne and altar, the old uh, ruling houses, the old empires uh, in Europe and so forth. The nationalists were on the side uh, where were considered left-wing and subversive. And therefore, we have to get outside the idea that we have today that nationalism is a right-wing thing. De facto, right now, nationalism is a, is a thing of the right, but it's not going to win if it just remains a thing of the right, if it remains ghettoized on the right. What we have to do is create a situation where nationalism becomes really the common sense of the whole political spectrum. So I would like to see nationalism uh, basically be left-wing, right-wing, and centrist. If you can so, hear that, I apologize. There's a dog barking outside, and my dog is losing it. So, oh, yeah, I could sorry. hear that. I was thinking, is that my dog? No, no, Gigi, yeah. quiet, quiet. I apologize. Continue. That's, no, that's fine. That's fine. It's it makes these these things make interviews <laughs> real, and people want it real. They don't want it too compressed and rehearsed and everything. They want it real. Yeah, so, I've noticed that about podcasts I listen to. I like it when someone messes up, and it just makes me just makes me giggle. <laughs> right. Right. Uh, so, yeah, so the, again, the, the, the simple point is that I define winning by having our ideas become the common sense of the whole political spectrum. So that no matter whether you're a leftist or a rightist or a centrist in terms of some political issues or in terms of your basic attitudes, the kind of person you are, whatever, liberal uh, liberalism is out and nationalism is in. Nationalism is the dominant paradigm. There's a, a political party in Hungary called the Munkash Part, or the Workers' Party. And Hungary is a, a really interesting place. I, I'm really fond of Hungary. I like Hungary and I like Poland a lot. There's a difference I want to go to. I want to go to both those countries. They look amazing. They've been doing really well lately. Hey, Gigi, quiet. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, they're great countries, and when you when you want to make a visit, let me know. Uh, I can show you around a bit. Great. But anyway, um, Hungary. Okay, in Poland, at, in the last election, the left wing parties got zero seats in the parliament. There, there's zero leftists in the parliament in Poland. In Hungary, there are leftists in the parliament, but. Interestingly enough, even some of the leftists are patriotic. So there's this party called the Workers' Party, which is an orthodox Marxist-Leninist party. And yet I watched a YouTube interview with the leader of that party. And he's talking about the migrant crisis and saying that, oh, no, he's uh, opposed to unlimited immigration into Europe. And uh, also when the whole issue of diversity comes up, he basically says, well, no, diversity is a, is a bad thing. In Hungary, we have all these problems with the gypsies and, and the Hungarians don't get along very well. So why do we want to add to our problems by importing more diversity? And I thought, wow. That, that's impressive. <laughs> that's impressive. You see, I, you know, the, even the, the Orthodox Marxist Leninists <laughs> and they're just a tiny percentage of the population, tiny percentage of the vote vote in Hungary, but still they're there. Even Orthodox Marxist Leninists can be patriotic and sensible on the issues that matter. And so for me, that is just as much winning as a situation like you've got in Poland, where there's simply no leftist parties in the parliament. Uh, in Hungary, there are leftist parties in the parliament, but they're patriotic too. And Either, either outcome is fine, right? But for me, it would be really very nice if we just had a society where degrading white people, exploiting white people, blending white people out of existence, ethnically displacing them from their homelands, all that shit was simply off the table. It was simply not a politically possible option. But we'd be arguing about social policy and feminism and abortion and tax rates and all those other arguments would be the same. It's just certain things would be off the table. And I would really like 
the end of our race to be off the table as a, as a political possibility. That should not be something that any healthy society contemplates as a, as a possible legitimate outcome of their political policies. And yet we are told to celebrate diversity in every country in Europe, every white country around the world, we're told to celebrate diversity. But what is diversity? Diversity is always defined as fewer white people. White people, yes. <laughs> I said the exact same thing in a video about a year ago in uh, the publishing world I was a part of at the time just kind of blew up going, how dare you? We just want to be included. But I think maybe, like you were saying about Poland and Hungary, do you, do you think the reason why they're like this and why they're still very patriotic and loving of their country is possibly because they were behind the Iron Curtain? Yeah, it it's a factor. Um, communism didn't do them any positive favors, but it did sort of put a lot of things on ice. And but it wasn't just communism because there's there's a Polish writer that we ha run ran an interview with at Countercurrents, and I can send you a link to it later. There's this Polish writer, and one of the things that he said I thought was very very valid was was the following: in most of these Eastern European countries, there was no indigenous bourgeoisie, no indigenous commercial middle class. The commercial middle classes were Jews or Germans. And during the war, the Jews were run out. And after the war, the Germans were run out. And so practically everybody in a country like Poland or Hungary or Romania is a descendant of workers and peasants. Hmm. Uh, the, the aristocracy, those people are gone too. They were run out by the communists as well. So the old upper class is gone, but the middle class the, the bourgeois class disappeared as well. And so what you've got are people who are sprung from peasant roots. And of course, even the workers were from peasant roots, if you go that far back. And they just don't have the middle class mercantile mentality that is so prevalent, say, in the United States. Everybody in the United States is basically psychologically bourgeois, middle class, even if we work for other people, psychologically, we're, we're still middle class. You can be middle class and be very, very wealthy, middle class and be very, very poor, but we're all basically have the same mentality. And it's an individualistic uh, mindset. Whereas a lot of these Eastern European countries, they just don't have that. It was never a powerful force in their society to begin with. It was always confined to out groups like Germans and Jews. They were the commercial classes. And so their mentality didn't really seep in and become prevalent. It's sort of becoming more prevalent now after the end of communism. But still, you have people who look at the country like a peasant looks at it had as fields. And they think that even if they could make a few bucks by raping the, the land or ruining the country, why would they do that? It doesn't make sense to them. And so they they just don't buy a lot of these bad policies that Western European countries buy because they're more bourgeois in the West. But beyond that, they were also spared the effects of, let's just say, consumer capitalism and Western cultural Marxism. And those are far more destructive, it turns out, of a society than communism. Communism was so contrary to human nature. Uh, you know, it's so difficult to implement uh, and so destructive that they had to put all their efforts basically into just keeping the communist system from collapsing under its own weight. They just, uh, which meant that a lot of other stuff in the, the realm of culture and education and folk life and things like that just sort of went on the way that they had gone before. And so it's very, very peculiar. Uh, they, they emerged from communism with very strong folk cultures, very strong commitments to European high culture. A, a lot of that stuff just emerged intact. And I think all of that has protected them. So there's a stronger sense of national identity in these countries than there is in the in the West and a greater tendency to be dismissive of globalizing schemes 
uh, than uh, than in the West. And so they're just healthier places uh, to to be around. And it's a great pleasure uh, to be in these Eastern European countries. I I've traveled in Estonia and Poland and Hungary, and it's quite refreshing. I definitely know what you mean about the mentality being so different here, because I remember I, I've spoken to I, I lived on all kinds of minorities, people who who I would consider to be extremely poor. And you ask them what class they're in, they're like, oh, we're lo- the lower end of the middle class. It's all middle class. So it gets me to thinking that people here don't really know real poverty, or if they do live in what I might consider to be poverty, it's they, they kind of have blinders up to what that really is. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Uh, the The thing that's so essential to me about the middle class mind, though, is the bourgeois mind thinks that comfort and security are the most important things. And people who aren't bourgeois just don't feel that way. And what that means, what that boils down to is this. It's always possible to dominate people, to enslave people in a, in a slow and gradual way by just giving them incentives to go along with it and say, you know, if you, if you don't go along with it, we're going to screw up your credit rating, you're going to lose your job, uh, and so on and so forth. And people just knuckle under because comfort and security are more important to them than freedom. Whereas in healthier societies, more traditional societies, you rapidly come to a point where people will just not put up with that, where they will say, no, let's fight. Let's fight. And th- that's what the U- EU is coming up against, uh, because you know they're, they're trying to dominate these countries in Eastern Europe and integrate them into the EU with gibs, basically. We're going to give you this, gives you this and gives you that, right? And uh, we'll build a new road, we'll do this or that, but you have to welcome all these uh, refugees. And of course, these countries, which were poor and backwards uh, for a long, long time, want this stuff. They want better roads, they want better infrastructure, they want investment and so forth. But they don't want it so bad that they're willing to sell out their future as a nation. And so there's just not enough people like that who who are willing to sell out their country for comfort and security in any of these Eastern European countries. And so politicians notice that and politicians themselves don't feel that way. And so it's very, very easy for populist nationalist sentiment to, to sweep through a country and for them to say, no, we're not going to do it. You can keep your money, whatever. I, I predict that the EU is either going to break up or it's going to back off. And by back off, I mean back off on trying to push non-white immigration into Eastern Europe. They're either going to break up or they'll back off. My prediction is they'll probably back off. I think there are already signs of them backing off. I think the tide is turning on refugees and immigration. I think the humiliation, really, that was meted out to Angela Merkel in the last election uh, will reduce her uh, enthusiasm for this. It already has reduced it. It seems and, like she's such a people pleaser. She just thinks the people want this, so she gives it to them. She thought they wanted more refugees, so she gave it to them. So, yeah, it would make sense to me, too, if she backed off it now, that she kind of had this humility thrown at her. I hope so. I, I don't won't know what makes her tick. She's a total uh, mystery yeah. to me. She's a total mystery, but uh, she has been uh, smacked around a little bit. Uh, the AFD is in the parliament. They have the Free Democratic Party in the governing coalition. The Free Democrats are kind of a classical liberal pro, pro-business pro party, but they're not for more EU integration and they're not for more refugees. So even if AFD isn't in the governing coalition, they have they have similar ideas that are in the governing coalition. I think it's going to make it very difficult for her to push this stuff any further. And it might be the point where slowly things are going to turn around and they're going to start getting rid of these people. Let's hope. So I do think that what's going to happen in Europe is the EU probably will 
continue to exist, but it's going to back off on some of the worst policies. And I would not care if the EU disappeared tomorrow. The people who say, oh, no, we have to have the EU to prevent another world Why? war or something Why? like that. <laughs> my, my view is that, look, um, you know, Europe survived and recovered from the First World War and the Second World War, but it will not recover from EU mandated race replacement policies because extinction is forever. So even if I believed that getting rid of the EU could lead to another European war, and I don't think that it's that's a foregone conclusion. Uh, I don't believe that at all. But even if it were true, I think that the EU is far more devastating to Europe than a war. And that's saying a lot. Uh, if the EU continues its present day policies and pushes them forward, it will be worse for Europe than the Second World War. I totally agree with that, because I was just thinking the other day, with the ways that, mu that Muslims tend to breed, and they have kids and kids and kids, eventually they're going to want to open up their own political party, and if they get any kind of control or any kind of power in there, or I implementing Sharia law, or heaven forbid, get control of nukes, they're not going to survive that. No, no, they, they won't survive that. Uh, there will be, well, they might survive it, but it's going to be a civil war. It would require a civil war, I think. I even heard a prediction from a good friend of mine. Uh, he was referencing some biblical stuff, and he said that he predicted, or, or there was a prediction in the past that claimed that Russia would be the country that liberates Europe from Islam. I wonder if that's true. It's, it's interesting to think about. Yeah, yeah. I, I think there are basically three options. Uh, Europe will be destroyed. Europe will save itself, but it will have to go through some kind of terrible upheaval, some European-wide war uh, of liberation, basically, where they start driving Islam out of Europe. Or Europe will save itself the easy way by adopting sensible nationalist policies and by closing the borders and then repatriating all these people from whence they came. And there's no reason why they can't. Uh, most of these people didn't exist in Europe at all mm -hmm. until the, the post-World War II era. Most of them, uh, not, since the not, not before the 1960s. Uh, and so it was feasible for them to come. It's feasible for them to leave. Uh, the, the only thing that's stopping us is a matter of will. I hope they tend to I hope they get that well over time. But even when I lived over there, before I was even red pilled on some of this stuff, for lack of a better term, the cultural Marxism, which I didn't know what it was at that time, I just called it political correctness, was so embedded in their minds. And I remember during Brexit, I was looking at my Facebook page at some of my friends from back in graduate school, and just the pure vitriol they had for any kind of nationalism and anybody who voted Brexit. And if you voted Brexit, unfriend me right now. It makes me concerned that they, if they would fight for themselves and what kind of personal experience it would take for them to realize of what's at stake or do they need to have it presented to them in a certain way. I'm not sure. I, I don't know what it's going to take because it was so embedded in their minds when I was there. Yeah, I... I don't know. It's not. There's not going to be one solution. There are going to be many different solutions. And for some people, they're they're just never going to wake up at all. I think that we will red pill people by. For well, first of all, events are red pilling people. Uh, we're doing a pretty poor job, to be quite honest, of changing people's mind compared to just the terrible consequences of multiracial policies and immigration and refugees and stuff like that. That is waking a lot of people up. And the, administra the administrations, the institutions, the leadership in all of our countries aren't really stopping those bad policies. Uh, a lot of them are doubling down on them. And that means there are going to be more terrorist attacks, more rape gangs and other things like that. And, and that's going to red pill more and more people. That's just inevitable. But in addition to that, we are more effective at getting our message out there so that when people finally start questioning 
what they're supposed to believe, right? Uh, the, we, there are places they can find alternative viewpoints, places like your podcast, pla- places like my website. There are many, many very compelling, rational alternatives now that are that are being offered. And this is great. So between the events that argue in our favor and our ability to interpret those events to people, to reach out, to attract people's attention, to get people rethinking their assumptions uh, in light of the news, I think that a lot of rational people are going to be awakened. Do we have to awaken everybody? No, we don't. But there are some studies that seem to indicate that if an idea becomes widespread and fervently believed by 10% of the population, and it should be, it can't be just any 10%, it can't be the bottom 10%, the least influential 10%. Uh, But if if it's believed by 10% of the population, and if this percentage of the population especially has access to money, influence education if if they're above average right uh there there will come a tipping point and these ideas will start spreading virally and start taking over the society what that means is that the hardcore opposition will shrink Uh, so what i envision is a situation where we've got say five or ten percent who really believe what we believe for good reasons and maybe another five or ten percent who believe what we believe fervently but you know their arguments aren't all that clear or whatever or it's mixed in with other stuff or whatever but still they believe the essentially correct stuff then there'll be a large number of people who will go along with it because enough authoritative people say it and other people will go along with it because we can credibly represent their interests in the political realm. And there will be a certain percentage of people who will never go along with it. But if they are a small enough percentage, they can just be politically marginalized, right? And that's that's what I hope. So we don't have to convert everyone. It's best to convert the smarter and better educated and more influential people first. And if there's a hardcore of opposition, eventually they'll just fall silent and be marginalized. And basically they'll be, in my utopia, the people who hate white people and basically want communism will be as marginal and looked down upon as you and I are in today's society. Yeah, I've heard it said that uh, we uh, we look we look like the villains now, but if we win, we'll be seen as the heroes. And it's nice to think about to sometimes you get a little black pilled about things but what would you say is the best way for us to reach out to people you said that sometimes we're not doing things very well but we are making progress what are some of the best ways people on our side can maybe reach out to those who are kind of on edge and thinking about embracing some of our ideas well most of what we do is online and i think that we need to put a lot of effort into that in terms of community organizing and creating groups and stuff like that well there's a there's a big learning curve that we've we we're negotiating right now so uh we have to keep trying we have to get better at that uh we we have to learn from our mistakes and improve Uh, in terms of things like rallies and so forth I I think that we have to be a lot smarter about things like that. I think Unite the Right did not really help us all that much. In fact, I think it was probably a net negative. Although, and and also, I I have no idea how much people spent attending that thing. People came from all over the country. I swear there must have been a hundred or maybe a thousand people went out for that thing. Probably half a million dollars got spent on that. You know, for half a million dollars, you could pay 10 people to work full time for a year on this kind of stuff. Uh, And I producing videos and web pages and stuff like that, producing propaganda. I kind of think that probably would be a better use of money. Uh, I think that we're most successful at engaging people on the web and 
changing the narrative, changing how people think and see the world. But we can't just remain there. We've got to create communities and networks, IRL. And I've been trying that. Uh, I'm no longer in the United States now, so I am watching these things from other parts of the, in other parts of the world and learning. But I've handed some projects over to people, and they've got to figure out how to do that better than I was doing it, frankly. So everything is everything is in a in a stage of learning. Uh, we're learning and growing, I, and I do think that creating real world community is is the next important step. And after that, uh, definitely having political activism. I think there's a consensus now after Unite the Right that probably the best kind of activism is on the model of the identitarian movement in Europe, which is low risk and high reward and also low cost and high reward and understands that the most important thing is not the 10 or 20 people or 50 or 100 people who show up for an event and unroll, unfurl a banner, but the tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people that might hear about it through the media, including our media. So I think that that consensus is a healthy thing. I think another thing that came out of the consequences of Unite the Right is a really good argument Andrew Anglin has made this argument. Uh, Donald Thorson at Countercurrents has seconded it and supported it, that it's probably best to rally to American symbols because they're under attack and they're being proclaimed symbols of white supremacy and all kinds of horrible stuff like that. And it helps us connect with a lot of people, normal people who are really uncomfortable with these NFL protests and attacks on monuments and stuff like that. We should, we should do our best to connect with white Americans. And I think that one way forward that's important for white nationalists in every nation is to be authentic to your own homeland. And it turns out that in every white nation, you don't have to go back too far in history before you find political figures and writers, culture producers, people like that, leaders who were sensible on the kinds of issues that we celebrate. And it's important to find those people and to graft our movement on the living trunk of whatever country we're in, the living trunk of tradition, rather than try and bring some foreign looking, foreign sounding ideology in and grafting it. So the United States had, was a de facto white nationalist society, even though it did have non-whites in it for a very long time. And white supremacy, if you will, was enshrined in our laws it's certainly in our immigration laws till 1965. Right. That wasn't so terribly long ago. So we can build on that. There's no reason not to. And as the left gets more and more agitated and gaslit and hateful towards ordinary white Americans, why wouldn't we want to do that? Why wouldn't we want to pose, not just pose, but be the legitimate heirs of the American tradition so that we can bring more of those people close to us and sort of capture some of their political energy. I think eventually that's that's what we're going to do. So those are just some ideas. I But I, I really must emphasize that we're weak and marginal right now. There are not that many of us. There are not that many of us who do this full time. We don't have ample funds by any means, you know. And yet we have great strengths namely our greatest strengths are not in terms of numbers and in terms of influence and power yet or in terms of money our great strength lies in the realm of ideas because the establishment has infinite money they can print it right they have well they've got all the power Uh, they can call out the police and the national guard and the mall cops of america to arrest us if they want they're, they've never been more powerful in terms of money and sheer brute political force, and yet they've never been wor- weaker in terms of having a coherent position, intellectually defensible position. Uh, and they've never been weaker as people because they're 
a corrupt and laughable group of people. And so we need to fight from our strengths. We need to fight on the intellectual grounds, first and foremost. That's where our strength lies, and that's where they're weakest. And in terms of street activism, spending money, politics in the real world, that's where we're weakest and they're strongest. So it's very foolish to pit uh, our forces in the things that we're weakest at against the state where they're in, in the area where they're strongest. And I think Charlottesville sort of did that. And so we can't make that mistake again. But I think we're learning. Uh, I think we have to be humble. One of the reasons why I like being in Europe is because the European movement is so far ahead of what's going on in the United States. They've tried a lot of things and perfected a lot of things that we haven't even started doing. I've tried to learn uh, from European groups. Uh, when I started the New York Forum and then spun off the Northwest Forum uh, and other forum type things have spun off in the United States that I have nothing to do with, like the Atlanta Forum, I was looking at the model of the London Forum, which is a very successful organization. And we need to build on things that work. Uh, and the European scene has a lot of stuff that we can learn from. So when I come to Europe, people often invite me to come speak. But I tell them basically, I, I will speak, but I'm really there to listen because there's so much to learn. Well, I think that's a great point to end on. We're coming on an hour. Can you tell my viewers where they can find your work? Yeah, you can find my work at counter hyphen currents.com countercurrents.com with a hyphen between the two words and you can also find my books all of our books basically are available at amazon.com i publish seven books now of my own work and more than 30 other books by other authors uh, through countercurrents five days a week we have new content on the website sometimes three or four things a day uh, we deal with politics and culture we review books on the alt-right, uh, the new right, and so forth, and you know, important movies. It's, it's a place where we are basically in, engaged in the cultural struggle to change our people's values and change our way of thinking. And we're also in the business of reappropriating the whole Western tradition for ourselves because really it's our tradition. And you don't have to go too far back in history before you find that everybody has far more sensible views on things like race and immigration and culture than our leaders do today. And we really are the legitimate heirs of our people's uh, civilization. And we're the only ones who know how to carry it forward into the future. So visit us at CounterCurrents. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to be on my podcast and take care, everyone. Bye.